It's now my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Inga Riest. As mentioned by Ian, Inga is the Director Emerita of the Center for the History of Collecting, which she established at the Frick Collection and Art Reference Library in 2007. Prior to that, she was Chief of Research Collections and Programs and Head of the Photo Archive. Inga was the founding president of Pharos, an international consortium of photo archives, an initiative which actively continues today. Holding a PhD in art history from Columbia University with a specialty in Italian Renaissance and Baroque art, Inga has published widely in that field in major journals and exhibition catalogs, including the Art Bulletin, Gazette des Beaux-Arts, and the Blackwell Companion to Renaissance and Baroque art. She has edited or co-edited five of the nine publications of the Center for the History of Collecting and has contributed chapters to several volumes focused on the history of collecting published by the Getty Research Institute, most significantly Provenance and Alternate History of Art, co-edited with Gail Feigenbaum. From 2005 to 11, Inga was chairman of the Association of Research Institutes in Art History. Since retiring after 37 years at the Frick, she remains active in the field, having presented papers during the past six months at conferences in Brand at Brandeis University, the New Orleans Museum of Art, and the Gulbenkian Foundation in Lisbon. Please give a hearty welcome to Inga. Thank you, Louisa, and thank you, Ian, for welcoming me back. It's a pleasure to be back here. I feel I probably need a cane to get up the stairs after all the years here. But, um, and it's really been a delight to participate in the, uh, the planning for this symposium, which I think holds great promise uh, with a wonderful roster of speakers. Let's see what band here. Okay. For many of us, thinking about art patronage and collecting during the Renaissance and Baroque period speaks of the province of princes, popes, and prelates. Lorenzo de' Medici and Federico Gonzaga, Popes Julius II and Urban VIII, or Cardinals Giulio de' Medici and Scipione Borghese, just to name a few. But in reality, the cast of characters that shaped the art collecting landscape of the late 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries was remarkably varied, calling on a broad range of talents that included middlemen and connoisseurs from all walks of life, social strata, and professions. As a consequence, we find that each in his or her own way contributed to a fascinating moment in the history of collecting when the modus operandi of the art market, more or less as we know it today, began to take shape. So over the course of the next day and a half, we will meet many of this varied cast, and it will be my pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to some of their ranks. Many are indeed kings, princes, and prelates, but others are artists who at times supplemented their incomes to serve as dealers, advisors, or experts called in for contract mediations, while still others are merchants, diplomats, or men and women of letters. In giving our symposium the title, When Michelangelo Was Modern, we signaled that we would focus on collectors of contemporary art in Italy, those risk takers who were willing to support and promote untested artists of their own time, unable to know the heights that those artists' reputations would achieve in later decades and even later centuries. But the truth is that the nature of Renaissance and 17th century culture, with its emphasis on celebrating the classical past, meant that collecting antiquities went hand in hand with taking a chance on a young artist. And the nature of commerce and diplomacy during the Renaissance meant that the developing art market was international in its reach, leading to the spread of Italian culture to all the major courts and cultural centers of Europe. A proof of this is right here at the Frick Collection in the two, with the two magisterial allegories by Paolo Veronese that were offered by the artist dealer Jacopo Strada to Duke Albrecht of Bavaria initially, but which were ultimately sold by Strada to the Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II for his vast collection in Prague. More on Strada a little bit later. Further evidence of how collecting antiquities went hand in hand with acquiring works by young artists lies in the famous story of Michelangelo's early sale of a sleeping Cupid to Cardinal Raffaele Riario through the dealer Baldassare del Milanese. 
The oft-told tale recounts how the young sculptor, knowing the preference collectors had for antique statuary, buried his sculpture, carved in a manner imitative, even rivaling the ancients, with the intention of roughing it up to give it the appearance that it had been unearthed after centuries underground. In the near term, the trick did not work <laughs> because Cardinal Riario demanded his money back once, it, uh, uh, once he learned of the, uh, the deception. But in the end, uh, it, uh, the trick did nothing in the longer term uh, to, uh, to damage the young artist's reputation. And indeed, it rose for, uh, rapidly after that. And it also did nothing to damage the reputation of the work itself, which was subsequently acquired by Cesare Borgia, who in turn gave it to his sister Lucrezia Borgia's sister-in-law, Isabella d'Este. Steve Scher will be elaborating on this story and much more about Isabella's exceptional collection in his presentation later this afternoon. Significantly and apparently undeterred by the ruse, Cardinal Riario went on to commission Michelangelo to carve a more than life-size statue of Bacchus, um, which he also ended up rejecting, likely due to its drunken imbalance, but which then found a good home in the collection of Jacopo Galli among the many antiquities that he kept in his garden in Rome. Two descriptions of, the collection, of collections in Venice, one from the 16th century and one from the 17th, give us the flavor of the collecting taste of the times. The first dates to Mark Antonio Michiel's 1532 visit to the collection of the Venetian merchant Andrea Ordoni. And for the sake of time, I'm going to give you just short excerpts from that description. Quote, in the court downstairs, the marble figure of a woman draped headless and handless is antique. The many other marble heads and figures mutilated and scattered are antique. In the little study upstairs, the porphyry cup made by Piero Maria Fiorentino formerly belonged to Francesco Zio. This was an uncle whose collection Odoni had inherited. Then there were the petrified crabs, fishes, and snakes, a dried chameleon, some small rare lizards, crocodiles, and quaint fishes, unquote. But of greater interest to us um, was the room upstairs. There, Michiel notes, quote, the oil picture with two half-length figures of a girl and an old woman behind her is by Jacopo Palma. Let's see where we are. These were the marbles, I'm sorry. Um, the portrait of Messer Andrea himself in oil, half-length, represented looking at some antique marble fragments, was painted by Lorenzo Lotto. The picture representing Our Lady with the divine infant St. John, John as a child and a female saint in a landscape is by Titian. The chests in the same room, the bedstead and the doors were painted by Stefano, a pupil of Titian's. The large figure of a woman, nude, lying down, painted on the back of the bed is by Girolamo Savoldo of Brescia." Unquote. So from this we learn that Ordoni's taste ran the gamut from antique statuary of the kind Lotto artfully placed in his 1527 portrait uh, that is today in England's royal collection, to modern paintings datable mostly to the 1520s by Titian, Palma Vecchio, and Girolamo Savoldo, to small bronze statuettes, crystal vases, cameos, and shells, not to mention those petrified crabs. Intriguingly, Odoni displayed his prized contemporary works, including that portrait by Lotto, in his bedroom, which may seem odd to us until we recall that at this time, a typical Venetian house, the bedroom on the main floor of the residence, the Piano Nobile, served as well as a study and reception room, while the areas of the ground floor, the Androne, were generally used for commercial purposes and were, as Michiel describes, filled with fragments of ancient statuary and modern copies. It's also true that these lower areas of the houses could easily flood even in those days, so you didn't want to put paintings down there. Moreover, as Andrew Martin observed, Odoni may well have taken his cue from the first century writing of Pliny the Elder in his Historiae Naturalis, who also places art the collector especially valued in his bedroom. And now to an interesting foil to Odoni, the collector Daniel Nice, who's, uh, whom the 17th century chronicler of Venice, Marco Boschini, lauded as, quote, one of the foremost traders of the city and a great connoisseur of pictures. 
and who eventually gained notoriety for brokering what was understood even in its own time as the sale of the century. That was the sale of Federico Gonzaga's collection in Mantua to King Charles I of England. Nice's life was essentially that of a Flemish expatriate merchant in Venice, which worked out pretty well for him for a while, as the 17th century architect and author Vincenzo Scamozzi tells us in his 1615 publication, L'idea dell'architettura. Scamozzi positions his description of Nice's collection in the section of the book dedicated to the new trend for displaying private art collections in rooms called gallerie designed specifically for that purpose. Quote, Signor Daniel Nice, honored French Flemish merchant, adorned his portico and other room and another room, perhaps 40 statues of various sizes and almost 80 carved heads, a large number of which come from the collection of the illustrious Signor Simon Zeno. There are also around 60 paintings, a number of which belonged to the excellent Corradino, and 20 portraits in the hands of the most celebrated artists of all time up to the present day. He owns an ebony archive or cabinet completely decorated inside as well as outside where there are many small delicate pictures along with some singular miniatures. Inside are portraits of princes, woodcuts and enamel objects, engravings, and all the drawings of Albrecht Dürer and Lucas van Leiden. Well, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> In addition to a great number of drawings by the hands of the most celebrated masters, as well as all types of seashells. Somehow seashells haven't sustained their collecting value in the way that these people seem to remark. The value of this archive is estimated to be as high as 10,000 scudi. And indeed, when Nice uh, declared bankruptcy, poor fellow, he uh, kept the cabinet as his last holdout during the liquidation process uh, of his assets. Others who waxed eloquent about Nice's discerning taste, I meant to show you, were, uh, was Constantine Haugens, the Dutch poet and writer who later served as secretary to princes Frederick Henry and William II of Orange. Haugens described the collection this way when he accompanied the ambassador of the United uh, Provinces of the Netherlands to Venice. Quote, after dinner, Monsieur the ambassador was taken to see the admirable collection of the gentleman Daniel Nice, who after an infinity of paintings and ancient statues, showed us a small ebony ta table-shaped cabinet within which were so many rare paintings, medals, shells, shells again, and similar curiosities that one would need three days to examine, much less describe them. The collection's value is estimated at 16,000 ducats. Among the statues in his house is a real antique Julius Caesar, which we were assured came from the temple of Ephesus." Unquote. Significantly, in both Scamozzi's and Haugens' descriptions, matters of provenance and monetary value are apparently worth noting, attaching value both to the past ownership and to the work of art itself. Sadly, Nice's greatest triumph, brokering the extraordinary sale of the Gonzaga collection to Charles I, proved to be his economic downfall, not least because the king defaulted on payment. Uh, in the end, Nice had creditors from across Europe, from England as, to as far away as Transylvania. Certainly, these art merchants of Venice had great advantages as collectors, even uh, the most, uh, given the, the almost frenzied commercial activity in the Lagoon City at this time, as trade with the East and along the Silk Route attracted opportunistic foreigners from other countries, as well as from other Italian city-states. Tomorrow, Frederick Ilchman will be examining Venetian collections in much, much greater depth than I've been able to do here. So backing up a bit, let's explore the factors that fashioned a new collecting climate all across Italy and simultaneously elevated the status of the artist, the agent, and the collector above the dominant view during the Middle Ages that saw art as a commodity and the artist as craftsman. According to Falker Reinhardt, among others, writing in the anthology Art Markets in Early Modern Europe, mid-15th century art making depended largely on the guild system or its equivalent art associations and family workshops. 
The case of Neri di Bici in Florence is probably typical and is exceptionally well documented in his workshop diaries, his Ricordanze, which note all of his commissions over 27 years, beginning in 1453, the year after his father's death when he took over the shop. At the age of 15, as a third generation painter working in the shop his father inherited from his grandfather, Neri joined the confraternity of St. Luke, which would eventually become Florence's official guild. His ricordanze tell us that commissions came to this popular Florentine artist from people in all professions, tailors, bakers, cobblers, as well as members of the upper class and their widows. And from the records, we deduce that these patrons aimed primarily to decorate domestic interiors or even more commonly to adorn family chapels and funerary monuments, not so much to commission and own art for its own sake. As Reinhardt observes, this would change dramatically during the last years of the 15th century, when what he calls the individualization process took hold. The shift meant that individuals commissioned major works of art to enhance their own prestige, and in doing so, they exercised greater client control, as we would put it today. The result was a dramatic increase in patronage in cities such as Urbino, Mantua, and Ferrara, where art became a vehicle for magnifying political power and dominance, and the display of art, often in galleries dedicated to that purpose, as Scamozzi had described, would reflect dynastic stability. And here, clearly, we are dealing with patronage, in other words, direct support of contemporary artists through commissions, more than we are talking about collecting art of the past. The Medici were the most obvious examples of this, but by no means the only ones, as the Montefeltre and Della Rovere families followed suit in Urbino, and the Este and Gonzaga families did the same in Ferrara and Mantua. Cosido Mode Medici is said to have remarked, quote, for 50 years I've done nothing but earn money and spend money. And I, and I have realized that it is much sweeter to spend it than to earn it. Uh, and corroborating this, his grandson, Lorenzo il Magnifico, claimed that Cosimo had spent more than 600,000 florins on art, architecture, and civic monuments, such as the expansion, reconstruction, and uh, Fra Angelico's beautiful decorations of the Dominican, Dominican convent of San Marco. For the church, too, using art as visual propaganda became the new normal. In Reinhardt's opinion, begin, this began during the reign of Pope Nicholas V, who saw to the expansion and beautification of the Vatican Palace and uh, with the tower and chapel that bears his name today, also frescoed by Fra Angelico. Certainly, as the Reformation gathered steam and the Catholic Church triumphant retaliated, art became the most powerful instrument for galvanizing the allegiance of the faithful and for spreading Catholic doctrine in enormous, newly built and lavishly decorated preaching churches that sprouted all over Italy and the Catholic world. With the 16th century, the top flight artists came to be revered and enjoyed a greatly elevated social standing, Michelangelo Il Divino, as he was called, being the poster boy for this. With regard to Giovanni Bellini in Venice, though, uh, whose work Isabella d'Este was desperate to acquire, the Marchioness's agent Pietro Bembo explained, and this is telling, that Bellini, who was, by the way, the brother-in-law of Isabella's court artist, Andrea Mantegna, uh, he does not like to be given many written details, which cramp his style. His way of working, as he says, is always to wander at will in his pictures so that they can satisfy himself as well as the beholder." Unquote. Eventually, Isabella was able to acquire a small nativity by Bellini, which she hung in her bedroom, but to this day it is regrettably unidentified. Such self-assurance and acknowledgement of the elevated status of top flight artists is nicely summed up by the Portuguese humanist Francisco de Holanda, writing in his 1538 Dialogos em Roma. Quote, as for me, I give the highest price for the work done by the great painter, even if he has spent little time over it, and I value very little that which an unskilled painter has painted in many years of work, however they may call him a painter, unquote. 
And Olanda comments as well on the generous remuneration that Italian painters tended to receive. Quote, one great reason one can paint in Italy and nowhere else consists in the salaries and prices painters receive here. And indeed, as the century progressed, more and more artists received salaries as part of a noble household, which did not, however, preclude them accepting outside commissions. And this would only accelerate uh, during the 17th century. So now, knowing that the shift to what became a modern art market with, uh, with active agents and middlemen was fueled by patrons wanting to enhance their power and image, with the result that the status of the artist came to be recognized as socially and intellectually consequential, let's look at a few examples. Oh, here's Francisco de Holanda, my apologies. <laughs> An obvious place to begin is with men and women of letters, such as the humanist uh, uh, the writer Pietro Aretino, as well as Veronica Gambra, and Francesco Barberini's uh, multi-talented secretary and art patron Cassiano Dal Pozzo, all of whom uh, enriched the intellectual lives of artists as well as kings, courtiers, diplomats, prelates, and fellow writers and critics. Next, we will review the role of merchant advisors, such as Bartolomeo della Pala, the principal agent of King Francis I of France, as well as artists and dealers, such as Jacopo Strada, Vincenzo and Pietro Stampa, Nicola Renieri, and Paolo del Serra. Pietro Aretino was not to the manor born. His father was a shoemaker who abandoned his family early on. And yet with the help of noble patrons and through the sheer force of his talents as an author, playwright, satirist, and occasional blackmailer, he cut a powerful figure in the cultural and political life of Rome, Ferrara, and Venice during the first half of the 16th century. Thanks to his mother's long-standing relationship with the nobleman Luigi Bacci, uh, Pietro was raised in a sophisticated atmosphere that well prepared him for his years in Rome, first as the protege of um, the wealthy banker and great patron of Raphael, Agostino Chigi, and then the Pope himself, Leo X, and the papal nephew, Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who himself succeeded as um, Pope Clement VII in years to come. Having earned the moniker the Scourge of Princes, Aretino at times found himself on the move to escape death threats issued by his literary victims. But by 1527, after Charles V's sack of Rome, he settled in Venice, and there, at least part of his activity, was devoted to developing a somewhat surprisingly nurturing climate for contemporary artists. Viewing his collection as something of a teaching tool, he opened it up to artists for study and was even known to make introductions for them to see the antiquities collection of his arch rival in Padua, Pietro Bembo. He gladly received paintings as gifts from artists, knowing as they did that he would find opportunities to promote their work to his wealthy patrons. On a deeper intellectual level of support for young artists, it's interesting to note, as Laura Palladino has, that Aretino's commissions of religious works closely aligned with his own writings. For example, Titian's Ecce Homo likely relates to Aretino's The Passion of Christ, and Jacopo Sansovino's bas relief, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here, uh, his bas relief of the Madonna and Child is a rejoinder to Aretino's Life of the Virgin, while Sansovino's Statue of St. Catherine likely related to his Lives of the Saints that was published in 1540. Aretino's early patronage of Jacopo Tintoretto signifies the writer's engagement with young talent. In 1545, he commissioned the mythological paintings Apollo and Marcius and Mercury and Argus. And just three years later, Aretino wrote high praise of the painting that launched Tintoretto's public career, The Miracle of the Slave, painted for the confraternity of San Marco in Venice. Quote, there is no one so poorly acquainted with the art of design that he would not be amazed at the relief of the figure which lying wholly naked on the ground is offered up to cruel martyrdom. His colors are flesh, his contours rounded, and his body alive. So I swear by the affection that I have for you that the mean airs and looks of the crowd that surrounded it, meaning the painting, so greatly resemble the impressions which the crowd within the picture make that the spectacle appears to be real and not feigned. 
But despite all of this, do not become arrogant because that would amount to a refusal to advance to a higher level of perfection, unquote. We should note, though, that Aretino had, himself had no problem with arrogance because uh, when it came to self-congratulatory note, he struck at the beginning of these remarks of praise of Tintoretto's work. He wrote, now that the public acclaim confirms the praise I already awarded this great historia dedicated to the Scuola of San Marco, I rejoice no less in my own judgment, which is very precocious, than I do in your art, which is so surpassing, unquote. There's no question that Aretino's admiration for Titian was both deeply felt and well known to his contemporaries. The humanist writer uh, Lodovico Dolci's 1557 publication titled D uh, Dialogue on Painting called Aretino features Aretino as the character defending the Venetian style of painting that was championed by Titian. And it ends with a praising biography of the artist. Yet Aretino was not beneath criticizing the leading painter of his day either. Surprisingly, when he first saw the portrait of himself now in the P.T. Palace, he remarked critically that it appeared more sketched than finished. But it has been proposed uh, that here Aretino may have been thinking strategically be uh, because the portrait was intended as a gift to the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Cosimo dei Medici, whose court artists at the time adhered to the much more polished, highly finished painting style of Agnolo Bronzino. So Aretino's comment may have been issued to stave off potential criticism from the Florentines. More typically, Aretino was instrumental in brokering Francis I's portrait by Titian, which was well received and which would eventually become the king's image for the ages. The portrait dating to 1538 most likely depends on the artist's reinterpretation of a medal struck in 1538 designed by Benvenuto Cellini during his trip to the French court. Characteristically strategic in his use of flattery, Aretino accompanied the shipment of the portrait along with Titian's version of Mary Magdalene that's now in Bordeaux with these words. Here most saintly king are the two works, one magnifying the honor of men, the other magnifying the glory of God." Unquote. We thus can conclude that even as Pietro Aretino was the scourge of princes, in his dealings with artists, he showed a softer and more human side. In sharp contrast to the acerbic literary life uh, of Pietro Aretino is another 16th century humanist patron, this time a woman of great sophistication, Veronica Gambara of Correggio. Born to a prominent family with a long lineage of female intellectuals, who included Emilia Pia, the principal female exemplar of virtue in Baldassare Castiglione's The Courtier, Gambara made the most of her humanist education, acquired side by side with her brothers, as well as of her talent as a poet, to promote the arts and establish her court at Correggio as an essential destination for artists and, and scholars. By the age of 17, her literary mentor became the eminent scholar Pietro Bembo, which may account for Aretino dubbing his rival's protege a laureated harlot. And perhaps even more impressively, after Veronica's husband's death in 1518, when she was still a rather young woman, she proved to be an accomplished stateswoman, managing the condottieri for more than 30 years and allying Correggio, the town of Correggio, first with Francis I, whom she met and very much impressed in 1515, initiating at that time a lifelong correspondence with the monarch, and then later forging an even more advantageous alliance, sorry, with uh, Emperor Charles V, whom she received at her court in 1530, honoring him with, a, uh, with verses that she herself had composed for the occasion. Adding to her literary and political achievements is her lasting contribution to the visual arts, resting above all on her unwavering support of Antonio Allegri, better known as Correggio. Gambra assuredly regarded Correggio as a personal friend, attested by her comment to Isabella d'Este referencing our Antonio Allegri, and also by numerous uh, legal documents for which Gambra asked the artist to serve as a witness. Not surprisingly, then, she took a proactive approach to securing commissions for Correggio. 
Some of the pictures he produced specifically for her are today only known from descriptions, most especially the panel paintings that hung in her garden pavilion or casino that were described by Luigi di San Giusto as marvels of art. But we now know that she played an instrumental role negotiating through her friend Scipione Montino della Rosa the commissions for several of Correggio's masterpieces in Parma, including the glorious frescoed cupola of San Giovanni Evangelista. Moreover, Catherine MacGyver has convincingly uh, proposed that Gambra also played a role in securing for Correggio other commissions from her friends and correspondents, including the Noli Me Tangere painted for Agostino Ercolani, as well as Federico Gonzaga's paintings of uh, the Leda and Danae that is in the Borghese, uh, the Villa Borghese. The last scholar patron uh, now that uh, went in active during the Baroque era that I will focus on this afternoon is Cassiano dal Pozzo. Born to a noble family in Turin, Cassiano was raised in Florence and educated at the University of Pisa. Interested in science as well as the arts, a friend and correspondent with Galileo, in fact, Cassiano moved to Rome in 1612 and soon became an essential member of the intellectual elite of the city. There, one of the leading patrons of the arts and the Medici Grand Duke's representative in Rome, Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte, who we'll see again later, ensured that Cassiano would meet, among others, Cardinal Maffeo Barberini, later Pope Urban VIII, and his nephew, Francesco Barberini, whose household, Dal Pozzo, joined as secretary in 1623. With Francesco, a fellow member of the scientific association, the Accademia dei Lincei, Cassiano traveled on diplomatic missions, uh, notably to France and Spain, where he saw and recorded the royal collections on display, especially that of Francis I. Like Aretino, Cassiano encouraged the artists of his own time, even though in his case, he was a passionate classicist. He tirelessly studied the art and culture of ancient Rome and enhanced those studies by commissioning contemporary artists to produce, let me see, here we go, uh, to produce drawings after ancient statuary and frescoes, such as the Aldo Brandini wedding that you see up top on the, on the screen. And, and these were all for his so-called paper museum. He also supported local and foreign artists through major commissions, perhaps the most spectacular of which is Nicolas Poussin's exceptional set of the Seven Sacraments that was completed for Dal Pozzo in 1642. Cassiano was one of several writers to leave us a record of the painting's collection of the French king, largely formed by Francis I, a great Italophile, and as I think all of you know, the last patron of Leonardo da Vinci. Although Dal Pozzo wrote in detail about copies ordered by Francis's heir, Henry IV, after some of the masterpieces hung in the bathroom at Fontainebleau were showing signs of deterioration due to the humidity, he unfortunately did not leave us an object-by-object object, uh, account of which pictures had entered the collection under Francis and which had come in later. We learn more about the formation of Francis I's apparently insatiable appetite for Italian painting by tracing the work of his agents, Giovanni Battista Puccini, Tommaso Sartini, and Bartolomeo della Palla. Of course, Francis did come by some of his greatest masterpieces the easy way, as diplomatic gifts presented by Pope Leo X. These, works, uh, these include works by Raphael and Giulio Romano, and likely a visitation by Sebastiano del Piombo. That, and that one being commissioned by Cardinal Marco Cornaro of Venice as a present to the French queen in anticipation of the birth of the Dauphin. But more challenging and more relevant to our examination of the modus operandi of the art market are the negotiations carried out by Francis's Italian agents. Early on in his collecting career, Francis seems to have held special admiration for artists active in Florence during the first decades of the century, Andrea del Sarto and Fra Bartolomeo figuring prominently among them. In 1516, Giovanni Battista Puccini sent Francis del Sarto's Dead Christ Mourned, known today only through Agostino Veneziano's engraving, as well as a virgin and child with Saint Elizabeth. 
while in 1532, the merchant, uh, the merchant Tommaso Sartini sent the king a Sebastiano, today unlocated, and probably also the incarnation of Christ by Fra Bartolomeo, both acquired directly from the artist at the convent of San Marco in Florence. But the agent who was by far the most actively active working on, on expanding Francis's collection was Bartolomeo della Pala. Through him, the king acquired literally dozens of pictures as della Pala came to be recognized as the connoisseur who had developed a sixth sense for what his patron would like. Notable among the paintings and sculptures acquired for Fontainebleau through his agency are Andrea del Sarto's Sacrifice of Isaac and Charity, Pontormo's Raising of Lazarus, and probably a lost statue of Hercules by Michelangelo and Baccio Bandinelli's Mercury, also lost. And then there's the whole school of Fontainebleau and other Italian artists who physically went to France to work for the king. Rosso Fiorentino, arriving in 1530, was recommended to the king by Aretino. Francesco Primaticcio was invited there two years later. And Niccolo Dell'Abate and Benvenuti, Benvenuti Tocellini uh, followed, just to name a few. And from time to time, these two were pressed into service as art agents for the king, as Primaticcio was on two different occasions when he was sent to Rome to scour for antiquities in 1540 and again in 1546. Thus, we find that border crossings were basically irrelevant when it came to art collecting at this time, when patronage and agency were understood to function on an international stage. Jacopo Strada, from whom the Emperor Rudolf acquired the Frick Veronese, continued to work successfully on that international stage. As an artist who had trained in the studio of Giulio Romano in Mantua, he staged festivals and produced extraordinary designs for metalwork. But he also served as a dealer in antiquities for most of his career, initially in Nuremberg and later for the Augsburg branch of the wealthy banking dynasty of Johann Jakob Fugger. Duke Albrecht of Bavaria bought heavily from Strada and was most likely instrumental in obtaining for him the appointment to the Habsburg court antiquary uh, for Albrecht's brother-in-law, Maximilian II, in Vienna. He frequently went to Italy on Albrecht's behalf to acquire antiquities, for example, from the Venetian collection of Pietro Loredan and from the heirs of Pietro Bembo and he regularly acted as an intermediary between the imperial court and various artists such as Titian and the sculptor Alessandro Vittoria. For the most part, however, Strada seems to have built up his stock by buying from existing collections rather than directly from the artists. As court antiquary, he assumed curatorial responsibilities for the imperial collections, but his sale of the Veronese notwithstanding, when Rudolf moved his court to Prague, Strada's influence began to wane, despite the fact that his granddaughter was the emperor's mistress and bore him six children. But, but in any case, in later years, Strada ended up dedicating much of his time to his life's work, compiling drawings by contemporary artists of ancient and modern monuments of Rome. Throughout the later 16th and 17th centuries, the kind of noble and regal patronage we saw with Veronica Gambara and Francis I continued, even as the individualization process gained momentum. Young artists sought and enjoyed sponsorship from aristocratic families, as for instance, oh dear, Rudolph, sorry about that. <laughs> as Giulio Cesare was favored by the Aldobrandini Pope Clement VIII, who gave the artist a knighthood as the Cavaliere d'Arpino and steered dozens of commissions his way. And Guido Reni enjoyed the support of the Borghese, as did the young Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Perhaps the best known example of this aspect of patronage is the protection the young Caravaggio received from Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte. Too often, Del Monte's exceptionally generous and nurturing patronage has been viewed askance, probably because of his pro-French political stance that earned him defamatory rumors about his lifestyle, some of them probably true, from the pro-Spanish factions in Rome who sought to undermine any prospect Del Monte may have had of ascending to the papacy. But when we review the facts, it's hard to envision a more supportive patron of the arts and sciences. 
Caravaggio was the greatest beneficiary of the Cardinal's largesse, as he was given residency in Del Monte's Palazzo Madama, now the Italian Senate, from 1596 or seven until 1600, during which time he is recorded to have painted vast numbers of his highly individualized genre scenes and depictions of saints that you see here. Moreover, Del Monte secured Caravaggio's first major public commission, the Contarelli Chapel in San Luigi dei Francesi, uh, and, uh, and made a gift of the artist's Medusa to the Grand Duke of Tuscany. But Caravaggio was far from the only young artist Del Monte would promote. By the time he died in 1526, the Cardinal's collection contained nearly 700 paintings a large proportion of which were the work of contemporary artists, including Agostino and Anibale Caracci, Cavaliere d'Arpino, Guido Reni, Giuseppe Ribera, Guercino, Saraceni, Elsheimer, and I could go on and on. There were just dozens and dozens. And toward the end of his life, he became an avid promoter of the classicizing artist Andrea Sacchi, though sadly the fresco cycle of the seasons that Saki painted for the Cardinal no longer survives. In some cases, artists who enjoyed support from one noble patron initially were able to trade up, if you will, as their reputations rose. This was the case for Pietro da Cortona, who arrived in Rome from his native Tuscany uh, with the sponsorship of the Sacchetti family. But then as his star rose, he could better position himself as the favorite painter of the ruling papal family, the Barberini, for whom he painted probably the most celebrated ceiling fresco of the high Baroque in Rome for the Barberini Palace. And in Cortona's case, as he enjoyed a reputation and level of prosperity second only to Bernini's, there was no such thing as an exclusive commitment to a patron, in fact, there rarely was, as he gladly took on commissions as demanding and rewarding as the planetary rooms of the Pitti Palace for the Medici Grand Duke. But back to the individualization process of the role art played in society and in the economy. With the elevated status and the high demand for both religious and secular art that prevailed through most of the 17th century, artists could expect to receive gifts in addition to monetary compensation. For example, upon completion of his works for the co-cathedral of St. John in Valletta, Caravaggio famously received from the Knights of Malta not only a knighthood, but a gold chain and two slaves. Hmm. <laughs> While Pietro da Cortona pointedly declined any gifts from the Grand Duke so long as he would be paid in full for his work on the Pitti Palace. Now, running parallel to this fairly direct patron-artist relationship and further evidence of how individualized the roles artists played with respect to the market had become are those who brokered deals independently and catered to a secondary market, which was increasingly robust as patrons and collectors sought out works by famous artists of earlier generations, such as Raphael Bellini or Titian, and as foreign buyers were increasingly eager to own Italian pictures as well. Two cases of this kind of independent dealing are Niccolo Renieri and Paolo Serra. Renieri, an artist who trained in Rome among the followers of Caravaggio, painted all his life but derived his income principally from sales to a British clientele, uh, typified by the ambassador to Venice, Basil Fielding, who himself served as a procurer or broker of Italian paintings and sculptures for his brother-in-law, the Duke of Hamilton, as well as for King Charles I. Paolo del Serra, uh, was a collector himself, but actively sold works on the secondary market. Do we have that? Yes. Um, concentrating on works by artists of the Venetian Golden Age and brokering the sales of whole collections whose owners found themselves in economic distress. A case in point is Sarah's sale for the financially strapped Grimani Calergi family of this painting, Veronese's Christ and the Centurion. He also acted as the agent for Leopoldo de Medici uh, and was a member of the Medici household for 30 years, starting in 1632. Collector that he was, he was always ready to sell anything he owned, as he remarked to the Medici Duke concerning a Tintoretto he was handling. Quote, I assure your highness that if I didn't have such a great need for cash for my business, I should wish to buy it as an investment, unquote. 
And indeed, in 1654, he sold his entire personal collection to Leopoldo and his brother. So here now, we have proof positive of the complete commodification of art as we know it today, and the basis on which the modern art market would develop and hone its modus operandi in the decades that followed, with power-wielding middlemen and the expansion of the secondary market through the agency of dealers and public auctioneers. Needless to say, I've only been able to introduce you to our very rich topic for this symposium in the most broad brush way. Some of the presentations you will hear during the remainder of this afternoon and tomorrow will expand on several of the points I've made, while others will introduce you to new individuals, such as the courtesan collector Elisabetta Condulmer, and special categories of collecting, such as drawings. Taken together, the presentations at this symposium will, I hope, give all of you an opportunity to look at very famous works of art that we think we know a lot about, but now through in a different context that enriches our art historical knowledge by placing the art in its socioeconomic and cultural moment. And we thus hope that by the end of the day tomorrow, you will leave with a deepened appreciation of the role patrons and, art and the art market played in promoting and galvanizing the reputations of young artists as they also defined what it meant to be a collector when Michelangelo was modern. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>